my name is Allison Toms, and um, I live in BC. I got my education as as a medical missionary. Te well, we're all teachers, but as a medical missionary missionary from Wildwood, Georgia. I'm not sure if I should mention that, but I did. I was there for two years at two different times. I took a six month course health evangelism, and then I took an additional six months for advanced health evangelism. And then after that, we went on um, two mission trips. My first mission trip was in um, Grenada in the West Indies for two weeks. It was really cool. And we were working with the Adventist Church and um, teaching stuff that I'm teaching this two weeks, right? I didn't actually have any hands-on stuff except for maybe some hydrotherapy for people that had certain ailments and um, like headaches or sore muscles or something like that. And then I, and then, so that was for that six months. And then I took the advanced six months and there was, um, I can't remember the mission. No, I didn't go on a mission trip after that, the advanced one, but that's okay. Later on in life, I got married to Henry. A lot of you know him, but he's not here. Um, he, after we got married, he took the six-month course, right, just the basics. And I took the 10-month um, medical doctor program to shadow the doctors to become a bush doctor, to go, like not a, a certified after 10 years medical doctor, but get enough um, stuff to understand physiology and to do um, things like um, deliver babies, like I took a midwife course, like, but it was only part of it. It didn't actually finish because they finished the program. They, they canceled the program, so I wasn't able to finish that program. But that's okay. But I got a lot of other experience. I learned how to diagnose diseases. Um, t I learned later how to draw blood, and um, it, it did the spinner thing. And I didn't get to advance in that as a nurse, but um, I got a, a lot of hands-on, and then after that trip, um, or after that school, I went to India for two months teaching another program, which is very similar to what I'm going to share here, and, oh, I, let me back up. After my six-month course, I went to Guyana for five months by myself. I wasn't married yet, and I was in the jungles of Bethany, and I was teaching health like a lot of what I'm sharing here, um, but basic stuff. And there I had a lot of experience going into the jungles, the jungle villages, and working with people that um, burn victims. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the men in the jungles, they're, they're loggers, right? And they carry these massive six foot long, heavy, heavy chainsaws on their shoulder. And they go around chopping down all those old trees to make money. And a lot of them have torn ligaments up here or or um, uh, um, tennis elbow, like bursitis and things like that, or cuts, bruises, because you know it's hard and there's a lot of snakes and spiders, so they get a lot of um, abscesses and other problems being in the jungle. So I got a lot of hands-on stuff and teaching at this college, my group, we would go into the villages every Thursday and do outreach and we would do actually do um, real treatments on real people. And out there, there's no electricity. And if you did have electricity, you're well off. But otherwise, you're heating everything up on, on coal, on a fire, right? It's, it's very primitive. And the water's from the creek, and it's, it's got all kinds of um, bacteria in it, like Guardia and other dungai fever and all kinds of <laughs> that stuff, and they, they eat with that water, they drink that water, they bathe in that water, they swim to refresh in that water, and we use that water, we boil it and do whatever we had to do and to do treatments right. And um, I was uh, doing a lot of massage and just very basic stuff. So in, in these two weeks, we're just going to cover a lot of basic stuff, and what I really want to cover as well is the eight laws, because without the eight laws, the eight doctors, which is from God, um, if we don't practice them, we get sick. We really have to realize how important it is to keep the eight laws and to do them faithfully, because without that, um, it's, it's really not good. So I handed out... Um, a paper here, it's just what to expect 
from this medical missionary two-week course, what I'm hoping to cover, I'm hoping to cover the stuff I, I'm not sure that I can get through all of it. It's because it's really extensive, and I, it, it's up to me how deep I want to go or how basic I want to go. I, I kind of want to go deep. I want to look at physiology. I, I want to look at our bodies, how they work, how they tick, what, what breaks them down if we're not being faithful in, in certain areas, and what, how we thrive when we are faithful and how we do better and, and how we can combat disease and so on. But um, So we're going to explore the eight doctors, each topic along with physiology and then using what natural means um, of healing. I'm going to do a hydrotherapy course and I'm not sure how many days I'm going to take to do that hydrotherapy course. Like again, it's up to me if I can get through all this stuff. Hydrotherapy, I'm going to do basics. Um, I'm going to set up the, the table. I'm going to do dry runs, not wet runs, and I'm going to have hopefully someone that can be my my person that I can do a treatment on and, and I'm hoping everyone can take notes. Well, I don't know, I'm, I was hoping we can talk later. But um, so everyone can see how these treatments are done. If you can just remember how the treatments are done and get practice at your home with your children or your spouses and when the crisis really comes, which is coming, we're expecting midnight soon, um, we need to be ready. Like just like that, like as if, you know, I, I don't know if anyone here has gotten first aid and CPR courses in the past. They only, they only last for a year, right? You get your ticket, then they expire. And every year you have to get re-ticketed, re right? Go through the course all over again. But the material's the same, it doesn't change. So once you're trained in that, that's good. You got that for life. Just remember how to, to do um, whatever you need to do to bind up wounds and so on. And, and same with hydro, just remember how to do it. And because when, like I said, when the crisis comes, you, you need to go out there, you have to be ready as soon as the call is, you go, right? Um, so introduction to hydrotherapy, I'm gonna talk about the use of water. I'm gonna talk about contraindications. Uh, physiology of the Bible, when, Bible, of the body, sorry. When hot and cold is applied, the effect of nutrition and hydrotherapy, what happens to the body when we eat healthy, when we stay healthy, and how the blood runs through the body, and, and we'll, talk, we'll get into more detail. I'm just giving an overview right now. Introduction to massage therapy. Um, we're, I've got one, two, three, four, five, five men in the class. I'm counting two that aren't here, and I've got one, two, three, four, sisters in the class? Well, we'll figure it out. Um, I'm going to teach how to do a basic five-minute chair massage, and we'll try to cover some bones and muscles, like some very um, practical stuff and common ailments that people have and, and how to treat. I only have two stethoscopes. <laughs> And I don't think it's going to be possible. It might be possible. I'm hoping that I can teach how, er, how to use a stethoscope and how to understand um, what you're listening to, diastolic and systolic and, and all of that. I want to just go over the components over that. We'll see how that works out. Um, well, maybe I'll take a, a day for theory and then a day for practice. Everybody can buddy up and take turns to check. I only have two cuffs just manual ones, no digital. And um, I want to look at local herbs, recognizing the uses, um, a basic herbs class, identification of local from BC and Alberta area. So I'm targeting where we live. And I know we've got some friends here from back east, but it's basically the same stuff in Canada. It grows right across the board. It's very uh, basic stuff. So anyways, um, we're going to see how to prepare and use for medicine and food, how to recognize a herb, recognize herbs growing in your yard, weeds in the backyard, using herbs as your medicine, how to use herbs and prepare them for teas and salves and poultices. So I'm going to have a fun class where we're going to make a few neat things like salves and uh, toothpaste, um, you know, things like that. We'll talk about the dynamics of of uh, the different components of what the herb is and the different parts we're looking at and why is it useful and, and 
you know, um, you know, it's all good. <laughs> um, I wanted to look at, um, yeah, how to use herbs to prepare them for teas, salves, and poultices. I just said that. Um, salve making, lotions, toothpaste, and more. Um, and I want to look at using food as your medicine. Um, last year, I know Joe was here in the class last year, and everybody else is pretty much new. But, oh, Kathy, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, you were here. And we had a couple of missionaries that have, I think, kind of like they open up their home and they bring sick people in to help them get better, right? And I don't know if they have a huge environment or just a small in the home one-on-one. -on -one. So their program, what they presented was excellent, actually very superb. Um, and I know I, I didn't get to sit in on any of those classes because I was upstairs pre preparing lunch, but I, I'm going to just repeat a few of what they had shown in demos, like the potato poultice, the cabbage poultices, how to use them, why we're using them. These are very important things, and these are things that you can do in your own home so easily, so I, I think it's worth repeating. Just for the two that have been it in the class last year, it's good for everybody else as well, and I want to repeat that. I want to talk about potato ginger poultices, which is good for arthritis. A lot of people have arthritis. Cabbage poultices for inflammation. I'm going to talk about cough syrup. I hope I have my ingredients because I want to make cough syrup. And um, how to use onions um, as the many uses of onions and garlic as medicine in the different areas. Um, we're going to talk about charcoal poultices. Uh, okay, next page. I want to talk a little bit about the different uses of clay, both internal and external. Um, I have a few samples of clay with me. And uh, I don't know what the soil is like here in Alberta, right? Uh, is it rocky? Is it dirt? You guys live here. Clay. Is there clay? What kind of clay, clay is it? What color is the clay? It's kind of a tan color. Oh, yeah? So pale? Like the color of that white bottle in the middle of the table? Oh, yeah, kind of beige. Beige? Okay. Yeah, beige, tan color. Interesting. So we'll talk about how to prepare clay and how to use it. And... Um, and how to use it for poultices, and, and we can also do internally as well. As well, and I, when I do massage, um, I only work on sisters, but I, I do facials on people too. And if they want a nice um, French clay, um, their face done after I give them a nice massage, then I put a nice clay mask on them until it dries, and then wash it off. And you know, it's just super smooth and super soft. It just brings out all the toxins out of your system, and it, you feel just pampered. But sorry, brothers, I only work on sisters. <laughs> um, but we have another massage therapist in the room, and perhaps um, he'll talk to you, brothers, about certain things, right? Um, okay, how to stock the simple herbal medicine cabinet. I'll have some samples here, and we'll just go over that a little bit in detail that shouldn't take too much. It's kind of a fun class. Just gives you some ideas what to have in your medicine cabinet at home instead of aspirin and Tylenol and all that other stuff that's toxic for the body to fill it up with herbs, right? And, and good stuff and salves, hey? Um, and I like to look at basic wound care uh, and how to do suturing. I'm glad this is a small class. I've got some bananas. <laughs> I'm going to hopefully get a chance to show you how to do sutures and because like I said there's a crisis coming you need to be ready you need to go like that as soon as the call is from God to go you go you, you gotta have your material you got the know-how you just go and help people because that's the whole point you're going to you've, you've got the everlasting gospel to share there's there's gonna like we're told that there's a crisis coming that uh, she didn't have words to put it, how to, how to explain. We know when there's war, um, I don't know if anyone here has lived through a war before or grew up in a war-torn country. I haven't. I've been spoiled all my life. I've seen movies, I've seen documentaries, and I've seen how, how horrific it is. And with a little bit of training, we can go and help a lot of people in their, in their suffering time, right? bring them the gospel, and then suture up some wounds, too. Um, 
And then the last point I'm hoping to look at is how to prepare for a crisis and be ready to go as a medical missionary. I have a bag. I'm very excited about this. It's my st stocking your medical emergency 72 hour bug out bag. And I got it for when I was at, um, in, in the US recently, I ordered it from Amazon. <laughs> Just, it's a super big bag. And um, it's, I'm going to show you how to prepare your fomentations, hydro fomentations already pre-done. You know, hopefully you can steam up your, your hot water and get your packs, your, your rolls ready. You're gonna roll them up, you're gonna get them in your bag three at threes, and you're gonna be able to go do door-to-door -door medical missionary with hydrotherapy, like, you know, the idea is, is to do that. And I'll give you more detail when we get into that program, um, and uh, along with some first aid supplies. Okay, so that's, I'm really hoping I can cover all of that in these two weeks. It seems like a lot, but we'll see what we can do. Uh, let's see, now, I have a couple more handouts here. I'm sorry. Um, I, I probably should have done this before I got s you. I'll you can you please? Thank you. Um, I I hope everyone's got a copy. I'm going to hold a copy for myself, and then I also have this to hand out too, please. No, um, I was told binders are coming, so you have to just kind of wait. I'm sorry. Do you want to hand these out too? Here's another one. I might need a copy of that too. Well, we're going to get folks find us. So it's just handout. And I'm, I'm going to need a copy of that too so I can go over it. You're just putting extras over there? Yes. Okay. Um, so what I gave you is a couple of handouts here. The first one I want to go over is the right arm of the gospel is the third angel's message. I probably didn't put that correctly, but uh, everyone knows these quotes. I'm hoping and I'm sure that everybody knows these quotes in Spirit of Prophecy. Um, and praise the Lord for God giving us these quotes. Um, there's, there's so much information and it's, it's endless. And right now we are on the verge of our probation closing. The third angel's message is upon us. And it's a time of judgment. It's also a testing time too. That's where you're gonna, it's the litmus test, right? Everyone's gonna demonstrate how they have prepared during the tarrying time under the first and second angels' messages. And the third will be midnight, right? And we know we're expecting midnight soon because <laughs> Trump just bombed Syria on Friday. The ball is in Putin's court, right? And, and we know that Christ comes like a thief in the night, midnight. It'll be a surprise to us. So, Lord have mercy, be prepared. Be prepared, and that's what I'm getting at with these classes, I really think. Our time is short, and I really think we have to be very sober and very serious about what's ahead of us. And, um, okay, so anyways, I'm going to read. I know, please don't fall asleep. Some of people in here didn't get good sleeps last night, but let's just bear with it. And if you want to stop and ask questions or interject an idea or an experience, please do. Um, we're all here together, and we're all going to learn together. So the first paragraph is from Six Testimonies 326.2. In the past, the health books have not been handled with the interest which their importance demands. Through a, excuse me, though by a large class they have been highly appreciated, yet many have not thought it essential that they should go to the world. But what can be a better preparation for the coming of the Lord and for the reception of other truths, essential, sorry, truths essential to prepare a people for his coming than to arouse the people to see the evils of this age and to stir them to reformation from self-indulgence and unhealthful habits. 
It is not the world in need of being aroused on the subject of health reform. That's a question. How, or excuse me, are not the people in need of truths presented in the health books? A different sentiment from that which has therefore prevailed regarding the health works should be entertained by many of our canvassers in the field. Now, I, I just want to add one thing about this paragraph. The contents of it is very pertinent to us. However, it's, it's written for canvassers, so coal porters, and we're not doing public evangelism, but, but the context is still very important for us today, okay? Just want to keep in mind about some of the quotes. If, if they are leaning in that, you want to take it in context for what we need it for ourselves. The indifference with which the health books have been treated by many is an offense to God. To separate the health work from the great body of the work is not his order. Present, present truth lies in the work of health reform as very, excuse me, as verily as in other features of gospel work. No one branch, when separated from others, can be a perfect whole. So we're seeing that these things tie together and it's a perfect whole when you have them together. You can't separate the health from the gospel. Um, the next quote, the health reform is as closely related to the third angel's message as the arm to the body, but the arm cannot take the place of the body. The proclamation of the third angel's message the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus is the burden of our work. The message is to be proclaimed with a loud cry and is to go to the whole world. The presentation of health principles must be united with this message, but must not in any case be independent of it or in any way, or in any way take the place of it. Health reform is given in its place is this section the gospel of health has able excuse me the gospel of health has able advocates but their work has been made very hard because so many ministers presidents and conferences and others in positions of influence have failed to give the question of health reform their proper attention and i really believe that's what we see in the adventist church i mean but I don't know if people are, are still, you know, you know just uh, that's what we recognize what's going on. So it's an individual. It's up to us as the lay people to take hold of this message and, and make it a priority too. They have not recognized it in its relation to the work of the message as the right arm of the body. While very little respect has been shown to this department by many of the people, and by some of the ministers, the Lord has shown his regard for it by giving it abundant property, prosperities. When properly conducted, the health work is an entering wedge, making a way of, for the truths to reach the heart. When the third angel's message is received in its fullness, health reform will be given its place. In the councils of the conference, in the work of the church, in the home, at the table, in all the household arrangements, when, when the right arm will serve and protect the body. The body being... Okay, so here we, we just recognize we have to take it into our own hands and, and do it because we can't rely on, on anyone else. And this is an individual work anyways. We're all getting ready for heaven individually, right? Health reform and the third angel message connected. The health reform I was shown is part of the third angel's message and is just as closely connected with it as the arm and the hand with the human body. I saw that we as a people must make an advance move in this great work. Ministers and people must act in concert. God's people are not prepared for the loud cry of the third angel. They have a work to do for themselves, which they should not leave for God to do for them. He has left his work for them to do. It is 
it is an individual work for one cannot, okay, these are my own little, oh wait, no, they're not, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Anyways, let me go back. He has left his work for them to do. It is an individual work. One cannot do it for another. And, you know, I just, because I just said that in the last previous um, paragraph I read, it is individual. We can't leave it for somebody else to do it for us. Sometimes I have a few of my own little notes underneath. Um, like, for example, the next paragraph, it's in gray. If this was in color, these printouts, that would be red, <laughs> just so you know. But while the health work has its place in the promul promulgation, if I say that right, of the third angel's message, it advocates, its advocates must not, must not in any way strive to make or take the place of the message. She's really emphasizing in these quotes that you can't separate it, not one over the other. And promulgation means open declaration of the third angel's message. That's what we're looking at. This is the right arm of the work, the health work. The three angels' message equals judgment, a shut door message. So if we're doing, if we are going to be tested on whether we're going to be faithful in the health message, basically is what it's saying. And, and I just wanted to say that we're all going to be tested on this. One important part of the work of this ministry is to faithfully present to the people the health reform. As it stands, connected with the third angel's message as part and parcel of the same work. They should not fail to adopt themselves and should urge it upon all who profess to believe the truth. Okay, so God requires of his people continual advancement. We need to learn that indulged appetite is the greatest hindrance to mental improvement and soul sanctification. With all our profession of health reform, many of us eat improperly. Indulgence of appetite is the greatest cause of physical and mental debility and lies largely at the foundation of feebleness and premature death. Let the individuals who are seeking to profess purity of spirit in mind that in Christ there is a power to control appetite. And then I just have a few of my own thoughts there, but um, yeah, like I said earlier, and like these, are, these quotes are actually saying it, not me, is we're being tested in this testing time. We have to be perfect in everything. Not only are we putting away sin, um, we're experiencing, I want to say it correctly, uh, incarnation, Christ in us, right? Um, uh, divinity flashing through humanity. We have to have a perfect everything. Sound mind, the ability to go and do the work when we're called, and he's only going to take a perfect um, a sacrifice, right? On our parts. We tested on our obedience to the health mm. principles too. Right. One important part of the work of the ministry is to faithfully present to the people the health reform. Did I read that already? Yeah, I think I did. No? The greatest hindrance. That's the one I read just a minute ago, right? No, I did read that. Um, I think I'm on the last paragraph on this page. The one class of books will always make a place for the other. Both are essential, and both should occupy the field of the s at the same time. Each of each is the complement. Each is the complement of the other, and can in no wise take its place. Hold it for a sec. You, you stopped at CH 131. We are being tested if we are continuing to advance in the health message along with the third angel's message. Yeah. The test that Christ had in the wilderness was on appetite. I was just thinking that as you were reading that. Oh, yeah. I, those are my little thoughts there, and I didn't read them. I, well, I thought you could look at those after. But, yeah, you're right. And that's true because um, it, it says up here in the bold, it says, We need to learn that indulged appetite is the greatest hindrance to mental improvement and the soul and, of soul sanctification, right? We're, we need to be sanctified in order to be sealed. And um, this paragraph is really telling you that we have to have our appetites in control. And then with Christ in the wilderness, his first temptation was on appetite, and he didn't sin. doesn't matter how hungry he was, 
Uh, he didn't sin. He didn't come to do that for himself also. He came to do that for us, right? He came yeah. to conquer, conquer diet so we could have control over uh, what we put he, in our... He's our example in all things, mind. right? And if he can control it after being hungry and emaciated for 40 days and nights mm -hmm. and still not sin, we can do it too if we miss a meal on 24 hours, right? Or if we're cranky and tired and hungry and we are tempted to eat between meals, like we're supposed to rest five hours between each meal, right? And say we, we're tired and cranky and we're hungry and go reach for that granola bar or an apple, like, right? We have counsel not to do those things. So, and, and I'm going to talk more about those things as we get into more quotes here. Uh, the one class of books, okay, I, I did start reading this paragraph. Um, I'll just start it again. The one class of books will always make a place for the other. Both are essential and both should occupy the field at the same time. Each is the complement of the other and can in no wise take its place. Both treat on subjects of, high, of highest value and both must act their part in the preparation of the people of God in these last days. Both should stand as present truth to enlighten, to arouse, to convince. Both should blend in the work of sanctification, purifi purifying the churches as are looking, that are looking and waiting for the coming of the Son of Man in the power of great glory. So I, I have my thoughts here is both of the health message and the present truth message are on par and that we can't separate that. Oh. oh. And both are sanctifying. God desires that now as never before the minds of the people shall be, be shall be deeply stirred to investigate the great temperance question and the principles underlying that true health reform. I'm gonna sit. So principles, we're gonna, s and, well temperance, temperance is one of the doctors, right? It's the last one? Tr no, trusting God is the last one, it's rest. It's Yeah, it's the, it's, it's the fourth one, is temperance and uh, so, like I said, snacking between meals when you're cranky and tired, <laughs> you're hungry, we got to practice temperance. Religion and health. True religion and the laws of health go hand in hand. It is impossible to work for the salvation of men and women without presenting to them the need of breaking away from sinful gratifications, which destroy the health, debase the soul, and prevent divine truth from impressing the mind. The Review and Herald, okay. And then I have another quote under that. The books of Daniel Re Revelation are one. The health message and our present truth message go hand in hand. I, I think actually that's my, my, mess my note to that, but it's the next part in gray. It says, when the books of Daniel and Revelation are better understood, believers will have an entirely different religious experience. Yeah. They will be given such glimpses of, an, of the open gates of heaven, the heart and mind will be impressed with the character that all must develop in order to realize the blessedness which is to be the reward of a pure heart. So that just ties into that. And then I have my own thoughts there. And then I have um, a quote for, from C.M. Uh, it says, God requires that his people shall be temperate in all things. Unless they practice temperance, they cannot be sanctified through the truth. Their very thoughts and minds become depraved. And that, I really think, is a really important uh, sentence. That's why I have it all emboldened there. Because uh, we're in the sanctifying time right now. We're settling into these truths, um, intellectually and spiritually. It's they're sanctifying us, but they can't really sanctify us if our bodies are not healthy or if we're being intemperate or breaking any of the eight laws. And that's what I want to emphasize as well. Uh, health literature, the helping hand of the gospel. Our health literature 
is the helping hand of the gospel opening the way for the truth to enter and save many souls. I know of nothing which so quickly unlocks a heart as this literature, which when read and practiced leads souls to the searching of the Bible for a better understanding of truth. The Spirit of God, as it comes into the heart by faith, is the beginning of eternal life. And I do want to add, when you get experience working with people one-on-one, -on -one, um, they have a need. They're, they're hurting, they're sick, they're, they're lonely, or for whatever reason, you go and minister to them, you, you go and reach their need. It really opens up their heart. They, they become softened, they become warm, they, they start sharing everything with you, you know, and touch. You, Everyone has heard when a newborn baby is born, if it doesn't get touched, like held in so many hours, it dies, right? Well, we're all like that. We can't live a solitary life. Some people think they can, but I think it then causes mental anxiety, and, and they're, they're not willing to admit that. But when people are especially hurt or sick, and we go and reach out to them, um, that's a very healing thing, too, in itself. And this is what the whole point is, is you're not just going to help cure their diseases or not you're not going to cure, it's God who does the curing, but um, or administer to their needs. It's a very, um, uh, it's a bonding, it's, um, what are some other good words out there? You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> right, so anyways, it's a bonding experience with the individual. It's, um, there's a word I'm trying to think of, but I can't think of it. But I, I've had a lot of those experiences, especially in third world countries where they don't have the quantities of stuff we got. They just got the basics, if they have the basics. Some people don't even have the basics. And they're desperate. And, and that's what we need to be prepared to go and reach. Like, don't be afraid to touch people or, or their diseases or their bumps and their lumps and their open scabs and their oozing wounds like don't be afraid to touch anything like show compassion and show your love because that's what people need right you can't you can't like be grossed out and somebody's oozing or if they vomited or something like that just put that aside and go there and help them out right because that's the, that's a human need good example would be when those um Ten lepers came and one cried out for help mm -hmm. and said, uh, Son of David, have, have uh, mercy upon us. And God healed all of them instantly. Yeah. But only the one the one that came wasn't even from Israel. He was from out of town, like right? Samaritan. Yeah, that's right. So Amen. All the other nine just didn't even say thanks. I mean, he just, I mean, back then, if you were a leper, you had to leave town. It didn't matter who you were. And you're you considered. Say, I'm clean, I'm clean. Yeah. I guess today would when AIDS first came out, right? Right. Mm -hmm. People were all afraid of uh, people having AIDS. And Christ broke down that prejudice, and he touched all of those lepers. And, and back in the Bible times, if you touch a leper, you're considered unclean. Mm -hmm. right. But he put that, that prejudice aside, and that's what I'm saying. Do you have your hand up? No, I'll go finish your oh. thought. I'll wait. I just wanted to add or continue that thought is just, I've seen a lot of yucky stuff on bodies, but so what? We're all made of the same stuff. We can be in that situation too, and people might have to minister to us, Lord willing not, because we're the ones that are going to do it to other people, but just don't be afraid to touch skin, and like, so what, right? Love people at where they're at. Yeah. I was just going to share what you were saying about uh, show compassion and love, and maybe you have this quote further on in your, your notes. But it's, it's a familiar one to all of us. It's in Ministry of Healing 143, Christ's method alone uh, will give true success. And I think of medical missionary work when I'm reading this also. Mm -hmm. It says, the Savior mingled with, the man, man at, with man is one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them follow me. So then we yeah. share the Savior with them. Exactly. And I wanna I wanna add to that there's a sentence also that I love in the same book. It says, His compassion knew no limits. Amen. And for all of us, we should because Christ is our example in all things, we should know no limits when it comes to helping people. Well, I 
the book on prayer, it says they thought that he was wearing himself out to the point where he would almost die. But what he would do is he would go and he would spend time with his father and be refreshed by prayer. And then he would be able to meet the next day, come to the next day. So he maxed out. But how he made it uh, through from day to day was his prayer life with, or communion life with his father. Amen. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It's so important to maintain that as well. Okay, so health literature. Did I read that one? Uh, the helping hand of the gospel. Our health literature is the helping hand of the gospel, opening the way for the truth to enter and save soul, many souls. I know of nothing which is which so quickly unlocks the heart. Yeah, did I read this one? Yeah. As health. Okay, you should you should tell me. Okay, so the next uh, verse um, quote is. The truth must come to people upon health reform. This is essential in order to arrest the attention in regard to the Bible truth, right? It's the entering wedge. Um, Christ healed before he preached. Yeah? I just thought it was interesting. These quotes you have are real powerful, uh, especially what we've been learning about the, the nature of man. And, you know, I know. About simple gratification. Mm -hmm. but, but one thing that's so interesting in regards to our reform laws is that this, when Christ entered upon this work, it was after his baptism. Right? And symbolically for us, when Christ would do these things, like the brother just read, he would be up all night, all day, tired, but what would refresh him? So he was always doing the will of his Father. Right? He wasn't violating any health principles. You know he was doing the, the will of God. And that's why it's so important to experience the, the steps of salvation that leads to baptism because then all of your works will be righteous. And therefore, when everything you do is righteous, that's Christ's method. And that's the method that can't fail. It will, it's guaranteed success. Mm -hmm. Rather than what we see now in our uh, uh, sphere of evangelizing the world. The works we're doing, they're good things. But are they righteous works if they're coming from a person who is not righteous or hasn't experienced this message That's to right. show them how to go forward? That's true. That's a good point. Amen. Many of those looked upon us hopelessly depraved will, if probably instructed in regard to their unhealthful practices, be arrested with the truth. Then they may be elevated in noble, sanctified, fit vessels for the Master's use. And it's true, it's the truth that really prepares us. I have been shown that in giving attention to this branch of the work, you remove a large amount of prejudice from many minds that, as, that has barred the way to their receiving the truth and reading the publications setting forth of the truth which we believe. This matter must not be passed over as non-essential, for nearly every family needs to be stirred upon this question, and their consequences aroused to be doers of the word of God in practicing self-denial of appetite. Is that the right one? Yeah. When you make the people intellect on the question of health reform, you have prepared a way for them to give attention to the present truth for these last days. Said my guide, educate, educate, educate. The mind must be enlightened, for the understanding is darkened, just as Satan would have it, because he can find access through perverted appetite to debase the soul. I'm informed by my guide. All who believe and proclaim the truth should not only practice health reform, but teach it diligently to others. This will be a strong agency in calling the attention of the unbelieving to consider that. If we are intelligent upon the subject in regard to, to healthful diet and practices, we should, uh, sorry, we would be sound on the subject of Bible doctrine. So there you go. There's, there it says very clearly and plainly how important it is. They go hand in hand. 
um, December 10th, 1871, I was again shown that the health reform is one branch of the great work which is to fit a people for the coming of the Lord, as it is closely connected with the third angel's message, as the hand is with the body. The law of the Ten Commandments has been lightly regarded by man, but the Lord would not come to punish the transgressors of the law without first sending them a message of warning. The third angel proclaims that message. Had men ever been obedient to the law of the Ten Commandments, carrying out in their lives and principles of those precepts, the curse of disease now flooding the world would not be. So, that's, yeah, uh, I, I have in my own little notes there, it says, um, the promise is that if people would heed the warning of the third angel message, the curse of disease would not be upon them. And as we go more into physiology and certain diseases that I'm going to tackle this next two weeks, these principles come out, right? Um, men and women cannot violate natural law by indulging depraved appetite and lustful passions and not violate the law of God. Therefore, he has permitted the light of health reform to shine upon us, that we may see our sin in violating the laws which he has established in our being. All our enjoyment or suffering may be traced to obedience or transgression of the natural law. Our gracious Heavenly Father sees the deplorable condition of men who come knowingly but may ig ignorantly are living in violation of the laws that He has established. And in love and pity to the race, He causes the light to shine upon health reform. He, he publishes His law and the penalty that will follow the transgression of it that all may learn and be, and be careful to live in harmony with the natural law. He proclaims His law so distinctly and makes it so poignant, prominent, thank you, that it is like a city set on a hill. All accountable beings can understand it if they will. Idiots will not be responsible. To make plain natural law and urge the obedience of it is the work that accompanies the third angel's message to prepare people for the coming of the Lord. Like that's all pertinent to us and I just want to highlight on the word idiots will not be responsible. I looked the word up actually. It's people who have a mental challenge at birth, right? And there's there are people that are born um, they have an extra chromosome so they're not quite capable of understanding the there's um yeah there's that too uh that's that's a poison caused by the mother when she's pregnant and when they're born they just don't have the capacity to understand and, and gurgitate and do these things they're they're in need themselves so that's what i just wanted to make clear adam and eve fell through intemperate appetite christ came and withstood the fiercest temptation of Satan, and in behalf of the race overcame appetite, showing that man may overcome. As Adam fell through appetite and lost blissful Eden, the children of Adam may, through Christ, overcome appetite and through temperance in all things regain Eden. Appetite is our lower passions. This, okay, these are mine. And when Brother Richard was just talking a minute ago, when he was talking about um, the nature of man, I am weaving those studies into my talks throughout the two weeks because I was just so blessed by it. Um, anyways, and so here I have my thought. Appetite is a lower passions. It's not a sin to have an appetite because we all have to be hungry and, and have an appetite for healthful food. But the sin is in the indulgence of appetite, like eating too much between meals, 
eating foods that are unhealthful, or drinking with your meals. These are a few principles that Sister White has in her writings. I met a woman uh, who was struck by lightning. Uh huh. And on her arms, it kind of showed this kind of strange kind of marking. Wow. And she completely lost all her desire to eat. Things completely gone. She had to force herself or make herself to eat. Wow. And then later she developed some kind of heart issue. And at the same time, she had a nine-year-old to take care of, so it was pretty tragic. Wow. Yeah, there are some very unfortunate, strange things out there. The lightning strike is pretty strange. Well, um, uh, I know someone who told me their cousin was struck twice by lightning. But no effects. No effects. Uh, Whole, like, totally normal. Like She was in her workplace. I don't know how that happens. One other person who got struck, nothing happened to him, but he got thrown across the room from wherever he was. So wow. The building, apparently, I guess it wasn't grounded up. Okay. Um, the Apostle Paul exhorts the church, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Men then can make their bodies unholy by sinful indulgences. If unholy, they are unfitted to be spiritual worshipers and are not worthy of heaven. Ooh, that's a very strong s sentiment there, hey? If men will cherish the light of God in mercy, uh, if men will cherish the light that God gives, that God in mercy gives him, upon health reform, he may be sanctified through the truth and fitted for immortality. But if he disregards that light, he lives in violation of natural law, he must pay the penalty. And the wages of sin is death. Um, ignorance is no excuse. Now for the transgression of law, the light shines clearly and none need to be ignorant for the great God himself is man's instructor. All are bound by the most sacred obligation to God to heed the sound philosophy and genuine experience, which he is now giving them in reference to health reform. He designs that the great subject of health reform shall be agitated and the public, and the public mind deeply stirred to investigate. For it is impossible for men and women with all their sinful health destroying brain enervating habits to discern the sacred truths through which they are to be sanctified, refined, elevated, and made fit for the society of heavenly angels in the kingdom of glory. Like all of these quotes are just powerful, hey? Like, and, and very sobering. Just, there was a, a quote that you read just previous, the CD 70.3, in mm. the sentence right above there, it says, but if he disregards that light, and when, when I read that, I think of a time, you know, when I didn't fully follow the principles of health reform. I, I mostly was, but there'd be that time when I did disregard some of the counsels and principles. And when I think back on it, that's rebellion. It is. It is rebellion when we're disregarding <laughs> God's revealed will and what is, for our lives. And what does he say rebellion is? It says witchcraft. So, yeah. so, you know, when I think of that, I never thought of it at the time as rebellion. But when I look back, I say, yes, the Lord convicted me that is rebellion yeah. against God when we disregard those principles. You know, for whatever reason we may have as an excuse, oh, I like that or I want to eat this or what have you, right. rebellion. That's a good testimony, yes. Yeah, also just through my experience, the, there's a quote, I can't get it exactly now, but I had crammed it just because of how profound it is and just from how I experienced it, is that if we, if we lose our conscious integrity, our battle, our minds become a battleground for Satan. Mm -hmm. We have fears True. and doubts enough to 
to paralyze us, yeah. to drive us to, dis to discourage us. Yeah. So I came to understand that all I have is my conscious integrity. Mm -hmm. I know that I am living and following God, according to all the light that he has given me, that I will not willfully uh, lose that conscious integrity. Because if I do it, then my, like it's on. That's right. Like that, like that switch is on and now it's, it's another, I, I, like the devil can paralyze me and discourage me and, and you know, like. And you know with the higher powers, is our thoughts and our intellect, right? To, we have, um, how is it, higher power and lower nature, right? Am, am I saying it right? I'm not sure. But anyways, we, if our thoughts are right, our, our actions are right. Our lower nature is correct. It'll, it'll go together. So if we can think correctly and do correctly in, intellectually, we will have that control over our no lower nature, lower powers, right? Lower nature. And, and God wants our higher power to rule Amen. and not our lower nature. And, and I know Brother Parminder had spent a trimester uh, just last, was it early this year or last year? I can't remember. Last year? Tremendous, excellent uh, three months when he was down at FFA. Uh, I'm, I'm continuously watching, re-watching a lot of those studies because it's just so profound and but that's it's all true like that's where we're at today and we need to have those higher uh, thoughts uh, the right thoughts the correct thoughts ruling so that our lower nature isn't ruling and in a and like I said in one of the other paragraphs that we just read um, it's not a sin to have an appetite we have to sister white says that we should relish our meals when we're ready to eat right when they come we should relish them and after you've had five hours of fasting between a meal or um, when your last meal of the day, and I don't know, everybody might be different. For me, it's at 2 o'clock, 2 to 3, and then from 3 o'clock to 8 o'clock the next morning, I've had 18-hour fast, right? And I relish my breakfast. And um, so it's not wrong to have an appetite. It's just uh, you're, you want to... Um, Control it. Control it, right? Yeah, yeah that's a good point. And, and then not spoil that fast in between because your body needs that rest. And I'll be talking to, about digestion, one of my topics sometime this week, how important it is, uh, what happens with our digestive process. So, where am I? Okay, John. sorry, what? John. Oh, down there? Okay. Uh, for years, the Lord has been calling the attention of his people to health reform. This is one of the greatest branches of the work of preparation for the coming of the Son of Man. John the Baptist went forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for the Lord and to turn the people to wisdom of the just. He was a representative of those living in the last days to whom God has entrusted sacred truths to present before the people, to prepare the way for the second appearing of Christ. John was a reformer. The angel Gabriel, directed direct from heaven, gave a discourse upon health reform to be a, the father, to the father and mother of John. He said that he should not drink wine or strong drink, and that he should be filled with the Holy Ghost from his birth. So this is a quote for parents. Um, you know, I, I know parents <laughs> are preparing their children also for salvation. And there's several parents in this room that are probably taking these quotes. Um, okay, so John separated himself from friends and from the luxuries of life. The simplicity of his dress, a garment woven of camel's hair, was a standing rebuke to the extravagance and display of the Jewish priests and the people and of the people generally. His diet, purely vegetables of locusts and wild honey, was a rebuke to the indulgence of appetite and the gluttony that everywhere prevailed. The prophet Malachi declares, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great 
and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Here, the prophet describes the character of the work, those who are to prepare the way for the second coming of Christ are represented as, or excuse me, by faithful Elijah. As John came in the spirit of Elijah to prepare the way for Christ's first advent. And I just have a little snippet. This is our work for in our time as priests, because we're all wise priests in this room, wise virgins. <laughs> the, den the self denial humility and temperance required of the righteous whom God especially leads and blesses to be presented to the people in contrast to to the um, extravagant health destroying habits of those who live in this degenerate age God has shown that health reform is as closely connected with the third angel's message as the hand is with the body now before I finish this quote, I've read that sentence in several quotes in the past in this paper, probably three times minimum, maybe four times. It's, it's just showing how you just can't separate this from present truth. That they just go solid together. There is nowhere to be found so great a cause of physical and moral degeneracy as a neglect of the important subject. Those who indulge appetite in passion and close their eyes to the light for fear, they will see sinful indulgences which they are unwilling to forsake are guilty before God. And just like Joe had said earlier, right? It was part of your little testimony, hey? And I think we, I mean, I've been there. Um, <laughs> I don't want to even talk about myself, but you know, I've been there. Even just up until like last year, uh, I think with the studies we've recently been uh, receiving it from FFA in regards to the higher and lower powers, right? And the study of, oh, excuse me, the study of incarnation, right? Um, some of the other studies we've been getting recently, uh, righteousness by faith. I tell you, all of these things, God is really stepping up the pace to prepare us. He's coming. And I have taken such a sobering look in my own life, like even as, as recent as last year, 2017, and I've been cleaning up shop. I've been cleaning this house, cleaning it up because, um, and I don't want to be lost. I don't want to be lost. Uh, all the sacrifices that God has done for us, that Christ has done on the cross, I look at that. I, I look at how my sins have crucified him over and over. And that's what I'm reminding myself every time I'm hungry, cranky, tired, and I'm tempted <laughs> to grab something. I said, no, I'm going to just drink some water, orange juice or tea or whatever, right? And, uh, and, and pray for... Um, like a victory because it's a temporal thing and that's what Satan wants to do right now he just wants to destroy us because he does not want us to succeed and it's, it's a tough battle appetite has got to be one of the toughest battles and I can testify to that but it's not impossible either like I, I know it's we're all we all can be successful right and it's through the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that speaks to our Minds that helps us to, or yeah. gives us the victory, gives us the victory. Sure. And we have to keep remembering that the Holy Spirit's transforming grace in our lives. Totally. And we have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. It's a battle daily, but we're all able to get. My first dad died at uh, 44. He was a workaholic. Oh. And uh, everything was uh, meat oriented. My mom would make this coffee, which would be uh, cream and sugar and coffee. We call it white coffee, and it tasted really good because I only I only I ate what was put on my plate because right? 'Cause I'm growing up, I didn't know anything about the health message. My parents certainly didn't. Uh, and then my so my my stepdad died at, or my first dad died at 44. My stepdad died at 45. Wow, uh, so young. So my first dad died because he was a workaholic. My stepdad died because. He went into his kitchen and he went to his house 
it would just blow your mind away. He had a he had a a, a, a stove with with a, with a frying pan on it, but he never he just kept on adding food to it. He never cleaned it. He just added it. And his his habits were just unbelievable. I was really uh, amazed why my mom married him. But whatever. Yeah. But he died. He died. He was ice fishing out on the ice. Ice fishing with my cousin, and uh, he was like 45 years young. So yeah, that's young. That's like my age. <laughs> I think that's still young. Um, okay, can someone tell me where I'm at? Uh, is it the people whom God is it? Uh, whoever turns from the light. Oh, whoever turns from the light in one instance hardens his heart to disregard the light upon other matters. In one intent, instance hardens his heart. Uh, who is, whoever violates moral obligations in the matter of eating and dressing prepares the way to violate the claims of God in regard to eternal interests. And I, I have a little snippet there that says this is showing a cause and effect principle. Right. And we're going to look into more cause and effect uh, with diseases. When, um, when diseases happen, why they happen, when we're not obeying the eight laws, uh, you know, for ourselves all the time. So cause and effect is a, is a very big deal and, and a principle in our lives. The people whom God is leading to be peculiar, they will not be like the world. But if they follow the leadings of God, they will accomplish His purposes and will yield their will to His will. Christ will dwell in the heart. The temple of God will be holy. Your body, says the Apostle, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Mind, body, mind and body submitted to Him, higher powers, lower nature. That's what I put in there. And then it says, moving on, the body is to be brought into subjection. The higher powers of the being are to rule. The passions are to be controlled by the will, which is itself to be under the control of God. The kingly power of reason, sanctified by divine grace, is to bear sway in our lives. Okay. The higher powers would be like the, the frontal lobe. Yeah, all of our, all of our reasoning, thinking is all done up there. It's the seat of God. It's the crown. The frontal lobe is known. As, I've got a, a study on that brain health. So, so like hypnosis, you're watching TV with the flashing light. That would shut down the frontal lobe. It's a bad thing. Yeah. We shouldn't be watching TV. <laughs> That's dangerous, but yeah. Well, any flashing light, you get on your phone. Actually, um, flashing light really distorts um, something. I'm not sure what it is exactly, two minutes. But people with epilepsy, if they see a continual black and white, black and white, flash, 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 or red and green, red and green, they can have go into an epileptic um, seizure. In Japan, in Japan, when they first came out with video games, there was a bunch of young people that were suffering from those seizures from the red color in those games that were first, when they first started coming out. Okay, yeah. It disrupts your sleep wake pattern. Well. Yeah, I only have two minutes. So, um, where am I? Pardon me? Self denial? Okay, the self denial, hu humility, and temperance require. Are you sure that's where I am? Page six, yeah, that's right. Bottom of page six. Six. Set six. six. Bottom, Bottom of page six. six. God does not require his children to deny themselves in the injury of physical strength. He requires them to obey natural laws, to preserve physical health. Nature, nature's path is the road he makes out. Marks out. Marks out. Thank you that he marks out and it's broad enough for any Christian. God has, with a lavish hand, provided us with rich and varied bounties for our substance, for our sub substance and enjoyment. But in order for us to enjoy the natural appetite, which will preserve health and prolong life, he restricts, restricts the appetite. He says, beware, restrain, deny, 
unnatural appetite. If we create a perverted appetite, we violate the laws of our being and assume the responsibility of absurding, of ab Absuing, abusing. abusing, sorry, thank you, of abusing our bodies and bringing disease upon ourselves. Um, one of the most, I'm on page seven at the top, one of the most deplorable effects of the original apostasy was a loss of man's power of self control. Only as his power is regained can there be a real progress. The body is the only medium through which the mind and the soul are developed for the upbuilding of character. Hence, it is the adversary of souls, directs his um, temptations to the enfeeble, to, excuse me, to the enfeebling and degrading of the physical powers. His success here means the surrender of evil of the whole being. The tendencies of our physical nature, unless under the dominion of the higher powers will surely work ruin and death. Um, I'm going to skip the new two paragraphs. I'm going to come down to the entering wedge. Uh, the third, the one the third from the top in the middle, it says, I can see the Lord's providence that the medical missionary work is to be a great entering wedge whereby the diseased soul may be reached. And I've already covered that. The medical missionary work is to be the work of the church as the right arm to the body. The third angel's message, excuse me, the third angel goes forth proclaiming the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. The medical missionary work is the gospel in practice. All lines of work are to be harmoniously blended in giving the invitation. Come, for all things are now ready. And the last paragraph. I'm not sure I want to read this last paragraph. Um, the Lord desires that the conference shall be connected with the, with the ability of his, he has given, Dr. Kellogg. He wants, his, he wants his people to make the most of the ability he has bestowed on his servants. He did not wish the medical missionary work to be separated from the gospel or the gospel work to be separated from the medical missionary work. These are to blend. The medical missionary work is to be regarded as the pioneer work. It is to be the means of breaking down prejudice as the right arm is to open the doors uh, for the gospel message. And that's, this is important. If you go back and read these parts in Sister White's writing under 6MR, you'll read the whole part she has. Kellogg, was that's what he'd done. He separated... Um, the medical missionary work from the gospel. He focused only on health, and today we have a lot of self-supporting independent ministries in Adventism that only focus on health. They're not focusing on, on both parts. Um, but we need to focus on both. We've read in her quotes numerous times over that you can't separate uh, the gospel, the everlasting gospel with medical missionary work. They go hand in hand. And I'm done. <laughs> Do we pray again? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit today and enlightening our minds through these very serious quotes. It was a blessing to share. I pray for each of us to be very serious for the times we are living in. Um, if we have a craving for something and we know we shouldn't eat between meals, that we drink water, go for a walk, go for a jog, take a shower, whatever it takes to dispel that craving. It's, our appetites have been bad habits for a very long time, and I pray that each of us focus on that to do better. We thank you for your mercy and your love. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs>